Hi everyone, my name is Fraser Kane. I'm the publisher of Universe Today, and this is your weekly space hangout for Friday, August 23rd, 2013. This week, uh, in no particular order, we will be talking about Zombie Wise. Wise returning from the grave, maybe. Uh, oh. A big strike of the Alma radio array. Uh, Mars, as big as the moon! Uh, solar flares are going to kill us all, or not? Probably not. I'm going to say not. Uh, Luca Parmitano's t chilling uh, details on his near drowning in space. Uh, everybody wave at Saturn, the results. Uh, Mars One update, and an exoplanet with a four-hour year. Joining me this week, crack team of space journalists. First, Alan Boyle from NBC. Live long and prosper. Brian Koberlein from Rochester Institute of Technology. Hi. Hey, Brian. Jason Major in the new house. Hey there. That is cool. Now, that picture in the background, this did you take it? I did. I did. Which means that you saw it. I did see it. That was the uh, at last Atlantis launch uh, in, back in 2011. <sighs> That's awesome. It was awesome. Yeah. <laughs> uh, and Nicole Gallucci. Hello. Cosmo Quest, a.k.a. the Noisy Astronomer. All right, so uh, first, before I get into this, uh, we've had a lot of people wondering how they can get an audio version of this, and Nicole, where can we find the audio edition of the Weekly Space Hangout if people yeah. just want to podcast it? So uh, the audio edition of the Weekly Space Hangout is available through 365 Days of Astronomy podcast, so you can Google 365 Days of Astronomy, or you can go to cosmoquest.org uh, slash blog slash 365 Days of Astronomy. Um, we are posting the audio versions of the Weekly Space Hangout, uh, of Learning Space, and um, the other Hangouts that we do through CosmoQuest, as well as your submissions, your podcast submissions. So go to iTunes. There's also an iTunes feed as well. Uh, go 365 Days of Astronomy, and you can listen to us there. Yeah. And uh, I know it's a bit of a delay, but they're, they're put in there yes. a few days after we, we do yes. the show here. So if you want the, the live version, then you can watch it live on, on YouTube or through Universe Today, which we post the video live on Universe Today when we're about to begin. Uh, if you want to watch it just after or li just listen to it. I, like, I'm the kind of person that likes to listen to my videos, which... <laughs> You know, you're, you could, like, you're, you're that kind of I'm person. I'm kind of that kind of person. I like, you know, even if it's like a show, I would like to listen to it. So I totally get the people yes. are, are saying, we just want to hear it. We don't want to have to see all the your ugly faces. All so, these awkward heads. Yeah, all these awkward heads moving around. Okay, I got it. We get it. Uh, second yeah. thing is uh, subscribe. So wherever you're watching mm -hmm. this, if you're watching this on YouTube, if you're watching this on the Universe Today channel, if you're watching this on the Astrosphere Vids channel, just click subscribe and then you'll get a notification when the new videos are there. And that's uh, that helps us and it helps you and everybody's happy. Uh, okay, great. So, and then the well, last thing... Do we want to do the sponsorship real quick? Yeah, you had... To, we were going to do... Yes. We warned this last week, so let's do it this week, so... <laughs> yes, so uh, 365 Days of Astronomy is still taking sponsorships to help out with Astrosphere New Media, doing all the post-production for these shows. Uh, so you can sponsor a, a podcast, you can sponsor a week of podcasts, or there's now a new option where you can sponsor a hangout. So somebody took up this option, so I'd like to uh, read this this uh, sponsorship. This hangout is sponsored by the Helio... Heliochromologist to honor all the many professional astronomers who publicly present to us the makeup of the cosmos, sometimes known as cosmetology. George, your friendly neighborhood heliochromologist. <laughs> so thank you for that very cute tongue in cheek sponsorship, George. Heliochromology. Wow. Yes. Uh, <laughs> that, is the, that is the first time we've ever had an ad for a that's he the word of the chromologist. Day. Yeah, it is the word of the day. <laughs> Uh, okay, so, and the second, the last thing before we get into the actual news part is just to remind you that you can interact with us. We are human beings. You can talk to us. We will talk back, but it's very complicated to do so. So uh, if you want to make a comment or question or feedback or you want to join in on the story here, there's a bunch of places you can do it. Probably the safest place is over on YouTube. So no matter where you're watching this video, click watch on YouTube, and then you'll see all the comments there, and you can post comments there. And as always, we love when you all post on YouTube because that raises the quality of comments comments on YouTube in general. <laughs> um, but you can post on the event page if you're watching this there, and you can also post this on uh, sort of anywhere on Google Plus that you're seeing the stream. But if nobody is responding to you, then maybe we just don't see your comment, and so just to be safe, post on YouTube or on the event page. The event page for sure is pretty safe, but YouTube is the safest. Okay, uh, now, God, I don't even know where to start here. I think I want to talk about Mars One. So I think I'm going to go to Alan first. And 
And Alan, so can you give oh. people a bit of background on on Mars One and then the crazy number of uh, of respondents they've gotten so far? Okay, uh, so uh, there there are a couple of uh, private company private ventures that are trying to get some Mars missions going, and this one sounds a little bit crazy. It's uh, Mars One, which aims to send uh, people on one-way trips to Mars. Uh, starting in 2022, landing in 2023, uh, and so they're just getting started. They envision it as this big uh, reality TV extravaganza where you know you have thousands of people sign up, uh, and then you have challenges, competitions where they go through Mars-like, survivor-like uh, contests, and eventually you get these crews selected for the trips to Mars and think of it as American Idol but for uh, living the rest of your life on the red planet as the grand prize. So uh, they started up for registration and uh, most recently uh, yesterday they said that they had 165,000 people uh, who were interested in, in taking on this trip. Uh, well that sounds like a lot of people and it is a lot of people, a lot of interest especially for something that uh, that you know, you're not coming back from Earth if you do win this trip. But it turns out that uh, not all those 165,000 people have fully gone through the uh, registration and application process. You, they do ask you to pay some money when you uh, apply. And so for people in the United States, it's $38 or so. Uh, and uh, it's probably more like 1,400 people or so have actually paid their money and uh, have put their videos online and they're trying to trying to build their uh, profile so that they kind of have a leg up when it comes time to to select who the candidates going to the next round will be. Uh, August 31st is the deadline for applying and so anyone who hasn't put in their application and paid their money by then are not they're not going to be considered for the next round and it'll be about two or three months they'll say who will actually be asked to come in for interviews with panels and then they get the ball rolling after that they hope that they get the reality TV contracts that they'll be able to try to put some shows on the air, generate some money, have to get the billions of dollars per year that it would take to actually do this mission. So there's there are a lot of questions and a lot of challenges ahead, not only for the applicants but for the organizers of this thing as well. <laughs> <laughs> Fraser, I, I, well, <laughs> right. So I, I mean, I guess I, I feel like I, mean, I have so many mixed feelings. Like on the one hand, it would be awesome to for humans to colonize Mars. I am one hundred percent for that. And at the same time, I don't think people understand how difficult this will be and how they're not coming back. These they're people not are going coming to. Yeah, that's that's it. Yeah, they're yeah they're going to, but they're going to live in a tin can for the rest of their lives. Possibly a series of tin cans. A series of tin cans, possibly for their shortened lives. And now, now on the other hand, you're going to have the situation where they're not going to come back initially. But if they actually get there and they survive and they last, then there's going to be more missions going their way. And eventually, there will be round trip missions. There's going to—I can just imagine there's going to be free uh, orbital. Uh, transits back and forth, right? That you can just hop on one spacecraft and join and come back. And so so eventually there will be return trips. But for the foreseeable future, there's going to be no return trips. So so I wonder, like, the psychology of the kind of person who says, yeah, I want to go live on Mars in a tin can for the rest of my life, is that the kind of person who should be going to Mars and living in a tin can for the rest of their lives? Is that the type of person you want to live with? But then again, if but then again, you know, there are all those types of people, so... Yeah. You know, yeah. And I, yeah. Like I just wonder, like there was this PBS documentary. I don't know if anyone's ever seen it. There was this guy. It was like back in the '70s or the '60s. He went up to Alaska and he he built his cabin from scratch with an axe and he cut it. And it's just it's a wonderful documentary. And I'm sure someone in the comments is going to mention it. That's the kind of guy who could go to live on Mars for the rest of his life. He was a loner and handy, and it was perfect. But I just like if 
like it's almost like if people are on the internet, they are not loners enough. I don't think uh, I don't think you could do it on Mars if you're a loner. I, I think that you have to have people who are pretty darn compatible and have complementary skills. I, I think that's the interesting thing about this is that they envision four-person crews, and these four people will be chosen as a group. It, it is almost like American Idol. Remember, uh, at at one point in the competition, they get these people singing together, and they kind of see how how people mesh. And eventually, the American Idol contestants go on the road and do these tours. And you've got you know ten people who are basically living together on the road. It's it's not the same as going to Mars, but I think that that if if you're going to settle another planet, you, you're not. Uh, it's not hospitable enough that a loner could do it. You, you really need to have a big support group there and then back on Earth. It, it is a little scary, I have to admit. To think it, yeah, it's almost that. like you're not, you're, you're, you're not too crazy, but you're not sane. You're just mm -hmm. <laughs> you're the right amount of crazy. Right? That's, that, that's, that's, that's the right. new tagline from yeah. Mars One. Yeah. Not, not too crazy, but definitely not sane. Right. <laughs> just yeah. crazy enough. Just crazy <laughs> enough. Right. Uh, uh, Guido Bibra says, I could swear that the Mars One guys have read Gregory Benford's The Martian Race too much. I wonder if the rest of the whole thing will play out in the book, though. I, I, you should spoil it for us, Guido. Don't spoil it. But, um, no spoiler. I wonder, I wonder how it ends. Uh, I, I do think that if there are some contestants that make it through, they should be writing a book. They should be making yeah. the notes. Even if they don't go to Mars... It, it might if be I interesting remember to right, isn't David Brent? Hasn't he applied? He has. Yeah, I've talked yeah, with I mean, him a couple a of times about author, this. Yeah, mm -hmm. and he doesn't really think that he's going to be going to Mars, but he just feels like this is the sort of effort that should be uh, promoted. And, and right. I think there might be a lot of people like that who put their money down just to see how far they're going to get. Well, well need, and that's it. And that's that exactly the person what too. You need you need the artists, and you need to at least have a few. You need artists, people, uh, photographers. They're crazy. Uh, people who can people. Yeah, they're crazy. <laughs> people who can, um, you know, write and and poets and that type of stuff. It can't just all be, and I hope it's not, but it can't just all be, you know, these 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 militant prepper type characters that you know that that are that are ready for, you know, to ready to hold up and you know. They're too crazy. Uh, actually, yeah. the, well, plus, the, if we do the, artists, we can just say we can't pay you, but it would be great for your portfolio. <laughs> this uh -huh. would be great exposure. <laughs> actually, the, the trip that David Brin does want to go on is that Inspiration Mars trip, the 501 day flyby where you fly past Mars. That he's ready to sign his wife and himself up for <laughs> That's that. That's the one trip. you bring your wife. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. See if his so, wife will come. Does his wife know this? I, but, I, but I think I think she does now. <laughs> but I, I agree with you, Alan. That you know, just the, or and and with David, that, that we need more stuff like this. That we need to engage the public. We need to raise money in ways that are outside of the traditional government method. And however far this goes, I'm 100% on board to the point that they actually put human beings in rockets and blast them to Mars. That's the part that I'm still a little on the fence about. But every other part of this, I love it. So uh, It just reminds me of an 80s movie. You need Schwarzenegger, a couple of other guys, and, yeah. and a beautiful woman. Find out who survives. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Total recall. Yeah, but I, would, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't sign up. I'm not crazy enough. Or maybe well, I'm stay crazy. tuned. Stay right. tuned. You're not right. the right kind of crazy. I'm not Andrew, Planet kind of crazy. Says, Andrew Planet says, it's our species becoming more like ants, and that as a planetary superorganism, individuals sacrificing their lives for the majority is okay. We need to create a human bridge, a body bridge. World War Z. Crawl all the way <laughs> there. Just there to you Mars. go. Yeah. Uh, speaking of zombies, let's move on to the next story then. Uh, good uh, segue. Good segue, yeah. Okay, so they're going to bring back Wise from the Dead, Brian. They, they are. They are. What's so Wise? Wise is the Wide Field Infrared Survey Explorer. So that's what it stands for. It's an infrared telescope, and it is done. Its, its initial mission was to do an all sky survey in the infrared. So it basically looks in all the different directions in infrared. And the reason that's useful with relation to asteroids is that they're fairly prominent in infrared. Uh, if you look at asteroids in the visible, it depends on their, what's known as their albedo, you know, how bright they are. So, so when you look at an asteroid, what may look like it's something small, maybe something big but dark. 
and what may look very bright may be small but very reflective. And infrared has an advantage in that the brightness in infrared is proportional to the size of the asteroid because it's actually just radiating off some heat rather than just reflecting it. Um, so it's a really good tool for finding asteroids in the solar system. And, and it did other mission, you know, the mission was doing other things as well, but it did this full infrared survey. Well, now they're bringing it back specifically to look for more asteroids. So but they're targeting... It seems a little strange to me that, that it's not working this whole time. I mean, if you've got a spacecraft in space that you can use for infrared surveys, there's all kinds of reasons you want to do infrared surveys. So why would it be, like, not in use right now? You, Money. You own a car. Why aren't you running it for 100 miles every day? It takes well, my gas. Question is, it I, takes I, thought it ran out of, I thought it ran out of coolant. Um, and which is why you know it it the the coolant was needed to shield itself from its own heat signature, so it could right. do the deep deep surveys. Um, so that, with that having run out, they started doing the asteroid hunt. But do they not need the coolant at all, or does it just have a little bit left? I mean, how does that all all battle you know uh, that, come into play? That I'm not sure. That I mean, depends it, on what wavelength you're using. Yeah. If you're at short, if you're at shorter infrared wavelengths, you don't need the coolant. Uh, if you're at longer infrared wavelengths, you're in the mid infrareds. This is what happened with the Spitzer Space Telescope. It's continuing its mission. It's actually hit 10 years this week, um, using short short wave infrared because longer wave stuff is where your telescope tends to radiate out um, and and is its own bright source. So coolant isn't necessarily needed at shorter wavelengths, which I assume then is what they're using for the asteroids. Right. So glad we brought a PhD astronomer <laughs> here. I took an infrared class. <laughs> did, you, did, you take, did you take one? I took a class on infrared astronomy from Mike Skretsky at UVA, so I know, I know a few things. <laughs> well, and that's one of the odd things about infrared telescopes in space is that you actually have to cool them. Mm -hmm. we, we think of space as being extraordinarily cold, and it is, but the telescope itself is not. Yeah. I mean, it, it, in terms of the infrared, it gives off enough heat that it can interfere with the observations. So you do have to have coolant in order to keep it from uh, interfering with the observations. Because initially, Wise was looking way past the solar system. I mean, it was it was looking deep into the universe. Right, black so holes. So it needed to be re yeah. Yep. Good. Well, I mean, anything that's going to help us find asteroids is a good thing. I'll yeah, I originally thought it was to find near-Earth asteroids that could threaten Earth, and I was corrected on that uh, when I tweeted about it. It's uh, probably tied to this asteroid capture mission that they're, right. that, uh, they're talking about right. and actually sounding more and more serious about, um, reactivating-wise for that reason. Well, and the two are somewhat connected, because if they're a close approach, then you can right. save energy to get to them. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah, it's great. Go out there, harvest the asteroids that are going to be on a close approach, and not only do you get their materials, but you also don't die. That's right. So it's good. It's good. It's that's, two a, wins. That's, a, that's a key point. I, I'm yeah. going to put both of those in the win column. Not dying. Uh, <laughs> uh, so, <clears throat> Jason, now you had a great story about uh, Luca Parma, Parmitano? Parmitano? Uh, Parmitano, yeah. Parmitano's uh, chilling experience during his spacewalk when his uh, helmet filled up with water. And, and, what, uh, and I'll let you get to this in a second, but the part that just amazed me was the the list of things he was willing to do, he considered to save himself if this was going to get worse. So, so tell, tell the story. It's amazing. Yeah, I was. Um, so it was last month, and there, uh, Luca was going on. Luca and Chris Cassidy, and they were going on uh, what was uh, Luca's second spacewalk. And um, they were, you know, do what astronauts do up on the ISS. They go out there and they fix stuff and everything. Um, and, and that itself, you know, we shouldn't downplay the, the inherent dangers of working in space. I mean, you know, they're, they're 260 miles up and they're going 17,500 miles an hour um, in the vacuum of space, you know, with nothing but their suit between them and the universe. So, you know, I mean, that's that's some pretty wild stuff as it is, but they're all obviously very well trained and um, uh, ready for emergencies and stuff like that. So, you know, the general idea is when they're going out of the airlock, and it's exciting. Well, an hour and a half into the spacewalk, Lucas started to realize that something's wrong with his suit, and he's starting to get this, you know, this, this wet sensation climbing up the back of his neck, 
And you know, uh, before long, there's actually little beads of water floating around inside of his helmet. And you know, in space, water does does some really weird stuff. I mean, it's not like here where it just kind of you know sprays around and falls. It's really governed by surface tension, and it wants to stick on everything. And it wants to stick on his visor, and it wants to stick all over his face. And I mean, and you know, and the water just kept coming. And it wasn't nice water. It wasn't like, oh, I want to take a drink of this water type stuff. It was kind of yucky water. Um, they, I mean, he said that it had a strange odor. At you know, afterwards when he was able to speak, and they brought him back in. Um, so anyway, you got this. You know, his suit's filling up with water. He realizes I've got to do something about this. Chris Cassidy is over somewhere else doing, you know, doing what he's doing. Um, they start to communicate, but he starts to lose communication. The, the water starts to go into the uh, into the uh, the foam in his earphones, so that starts to pop off. And yeah, so I mean, he he loses his communication. He realizes, all right, well, I, I've got to start to head back to the airlock. Um, meanwhile, you know, the, the NASA's talking about, well, what should we do? Should we abort? Should we, you know, because that's kind of a big deal, aborting the mission. Um, meanwhile, he's heading over to the airlock. The sun sets, so now he's so now he's lost communication. It's dark, and there's water covering the front of his faceplate. So he's basically blind, and and uh, he can't even talk to anybody out there. So the interesting thing is, where am I getting all this information from? A couple days ago, he wrote the whole story out on his blog on the uh, on the ESA website. So that, that in and of itself was a big deal. I mean, here we are just four weeks away from it having happened. Uh, NASA put together a mishap uh, investigation board to figure out what all is going on with the suit. And he's written up the entire description. And if you don't mind, I'd love to read one of the little excerpts from, from one of his, uh, uh, from one of his uh, uh, pieces here. As I move back along my route towards the airlock, I become more and more certain that the water is increasing. I feel it covering the sponge on my earphones, and I wonder whether I'll lose audio contact. The water has also almost completely covered the front of my visor, sticking to it and obscuring my vision. I realize that to get over one of the antennae on my route, I'll have to move my body into a vertical position, also in order for my safety cable to rewind normally. At that moment, as I turn upside down, two things happen. The sun sets, and my ability to see, already compromised by the water, completely vanishes, making my eyes useless. But worse than that, the water covers my nose, a really awful sensation that I make worse by my vain attempts to move the water by shaking my head. By now, the upper part of the helmet is full of water, and I can't even be sure that the next time I breathe, I'll fill up my lungs with air and not liquid. So that's, that's just a, you know this, this really, really chilling account. Of, of a scary situation in orbit. Um, luckily, he was uh, uh, Luca was able to get back into the airlock. Chris gave him, um, you know, some help, close that up. But even in the airlock, he had to worry about repressurization. Um, he wasn't out of the woods yet, but he does. He did say that he knew that if he, you know, if he had to, he could take his helmet off. Um, he may pass out inside the airlock before it's repressurized, but you know, at least then he knew he wouldn't drown. So that's if you want to read more, it's um it's it's over on the ESA blog, and uh, the article is also up over on Universe Today um, with a lot more excerpts from there. But wow. it's uh it was a really really harrowing experience, um and and you know again thanks to thanks to Luca for sharing it with all of us. Well, wasn't he saying that that he was also considering like letting off some of the pressure? Right yeah, that space. was that was another option. He was before he actually went into the airlock. Um, he was he was considering opening up a a valve in his helmet, which would basically suck a lot of that or blow a lot of that liquid out um, until it froze in place, sealing up the hole. But it would um, you know it would get rid of some of it. But you know the idea of putting a hole in your spacesuit while you're out in orbit uh, really isn't something that I'm sure that they ever want to ever want to have to do. Oh, oh man! And it, I mean, you can just imagine. I mean, astronauts generally are just so—they just downplay all mm. this kind of stuff so much. And so, for 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 him to just go into such detail, and you could just imagine the kind of hope. I mean, here's a guy uh, who's a test fear, pilot. Right? You know, I mean, yeah. he's an Italian test pilot. Obviously, uh, uh, scary scenarios are not uh, uh, alien to him. So, you know, he's prepared to kind of keep cool in a situation. Um, but even still, 
I, I can't even imagine going through something like that. But luckily, it all turned out. I, I think out. that's an that's an interesting issue. Is that in the old days, uh, you might never have heard about those stories until somebody wrote a, wrote their memoir. But mm -hmm. uh, mm -hmm. nowadays, when uh, even astronauts are tweeting all the time and and they have their own blogs, I, I think you're maybe you're getting a little bit more of the inside story. I remember when this first came out, uh, NASA kind of downplayed it. Uh, they did say it was a serious uh, incident, but uh, I, but they I said there was they, no danger. They didn't. Yeah, they, that they was that was a bullet point. They said there yeah. was, the astronauts were in no danger, and it right. sure didn't sound like that by reading uh, his first-hand account. That there, right, there was right. No danger. Mm -hmm. Thanks for the new nightmare, Jason. <laughs> <laughs> I, yeah. I think George Clooney is in that movie. I, I, I just kudos, Jason. You told that really well too. I gotta yeah. say, the way you were describing the the situation that was fantastic. Well, you know, here we are in 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 a time where where uh, more and more real science movies are starting to come out. Um, you know, Europa Report uh, had had you know real science, but also in a sci-fi setting. Gravity is coming out in October. Um, you know, maybe a little more fantastic, but still based around astronaut experiences. Uh, this isn't a movie. This is the real stuff. And you know what? It's a lot scarier than anything I've ever seen put on the screen. Yeah, yeah. No, fantastic. Uh, Nicole, let's talk about a strike. Well, we've got good news first and bad news. Talking about good news, the science coming out of Alma. Uh, there was a new, uh, new story about um, Starbirth, and, and Phil Plate wrote an excellent blog post entitled, Twin Baby Stars Belch Into Their Mama's Face. <laughs> <laughs> and there was some <laughs> Some colorful commentary going on on Google Plus about that, um, but this is a really gorgeous image um, of uh, two jets. There, it's called a Herbig Harrow object, uh, coming from a uh, baby star. And what's interesting is that the um, the Alma Alma telescopes. This is the millimeter sub millimeter array in Chile at uh, sixteen thousand feet that I went to back in March. Very isolated, desolate uh, location. Um, doing great science, even though it's still in commissioning phase. Um, what they saw were these jets of material, this carbon monoxide um, gas, and it was going coming out f from the jet around the newborn star about three or four times faster than uh, they normally thought it would it'd be coming out. It's ever been seen before. And so there's a lot since um, we still don't quite know the details of how stars form. We have an idea that matter collapses down into something. There's an accretion disk of, of material f that's, that's falling onto the star and there are jets of material often coming out from the stars, but the actual details of the physics aren't as, aren't uh, quite nailed down. And so being able to make these measurements of the CO, the carbon monoxide gas, uh, coming out in these really fast jets is really cool. And it's something that only this radio telescope can do, because in the optical picture, one side of the jet is completely obscured by dust. And so it's it's um, makes it a unique job for this, for this telescope. Oh, thank you. You're showing the picture. So, uh, yeah, Fraser's showing the picture um, of the ALMA data plus the optical data. Uh, all that green and red stuff is um, stuff that you would not see um, in the optical data. That's what you need ALMA for. So, this great news story came out. Um, I'll share the, the um, post, uh, Phil's post about it because it was very... Uh, right on the heels of this science announcement, um, news began to trickle out that the uh, workers at ALMA are on strike. And so this is what Fraser was referring to. Um, so um, I can share, um, there's a, a blog post about it from, a Chile, from a, an astronomer working at the University of Chile who's been collecting both the English and Spanish links. Um, the Santiago Times has, has a good article in English. Um, there's um, CNN Chile has, has an article in Spanish with video. Basically, about 200 workers at the site, so mostly technicians and administrators, are on strike. Uh, they have been um, trying, they've been doing a collective bargaining process with uh, AUI since July 1st. AUI is uh, Associated Universities Incorporated. That is the organization that manages the National Radio Astronomy Observatory and uh, a lot of what's happening down at ALMA. And uh, I, I have to say, it. The way it's been, I don't know the exact details of what's going on because I don't work for NRAO anymore, um, but it does not look good for AUI in that they have not uh, conceded to any of the demands of the workers for higher pay, for a raise, and for hazard pay. Now, I understand, now some people are saying, you know, the, the condition, they haven't been listened to for a while. Some people close to it are saying, 
um, that they're asking for too much, and other people are pointing out that being a, a scientific observatory funded by several world governments, it's not like a company which can easily redirect funding. You've got uh, the you know, governing bodies of several countries involved in uh, determining the level of funding that this project gets, and so AUI may have its hands tied in how much it actually can give the workers, but like I said, the way it's being written up, um, it, it's not sounding very good for them, so the um, Alma has said that they are continuing basic operations, that they have a contingency plan in place. I don't know what that is, um, but they hope to keep basic operations going. So, you know, obviously the telescopes aren't going to rust and go to pot out there, um, but this may be slowing down or, or the uh, science that's coming out of Alma as it's uh, just after, a few months after its inauguration. You, so. That's unexpected. Yeah, yeah. I don't. I, I can't think of any major observatory that's been on strike before that is just you know stopped or major scientific institution like that, that that's had to stop working because of a strike um, and the conditions are harsh I mean the conditions are really harsh it's isolated it's dry it's high altitude uh, you know workers have to have oxygen wear oxygen tanks at the high site there's no doubt that it's a dangerous environment um, so we'll be uh, watching that pretty closely to see to see how it how it pans out all right, well, I'm going to do a quick story here. Um, now, I, we didn't write anything on Universe Today about this yet, but I'm sure we will. But this is this thing going around that Mars is going to be as big as the moon in the sky. Because we've never seen that one before. <laughs> <laughs> I know, I know. You're all, dude, you're all numb. But, but it's, it's, so it's big on Facebook right now. And it's, like, it's crazy big. There's like one has gotten like 500,000 likes. And, and so if you haven't heard about this, there's this meme going around that on August 27th, Mars will be as big as the moon in the sky. And this is ridiculous, obviously. It's not going to be as big as the moon in the sky. Uh, Mars compared to the moon, when Mars is at its closest point, is about 80 times smaller than the, than the moon in the sky. Uh, but not only is this, it's actually right now, Mars is on the other side of the, of the, of the sun. So in fact... You can't even see Mars. So the so this but this is this meme that just keeps regurgitating year after year after year, and and it started in 2003 when Mars was at its closest point to the Earth. In fact, it was historically it was going to be the closest point in 50,000 years, and Mars was gorgeous. It was big. It was bright. And it was red. But not, it was still not as big as the Moon. It was still no. 80 times smaller than well. the than the Moon. But how this started was that someone had written this really nice post out there and had, had written this article and sent an email or whatever and at the very bottom had added a sentence that said something like, in a small telescope, if you look at the small telescope, you will see an 80 power telescope, you will see Mars in the telescope look as big as if you looked at the moon with your unaided eye, that the two 80 power, right? And, but but then somehow that thing got removed from the bottom of this post, and then it just got sent year after year after year because it includes the date, but they removed the year. But now it's just like Phil, Phil's got this great article, and I highly recommend you go and check it out. But it's clearly just somebody is just lying. Like just well, lying. It, and the just, way that I got this email years ago um, – if you look at just the text of the email, because uh, it's, it's that set of several PowerPoint slides, yeah. if you look at just the text, the text is correct. They kept the text about the telescope, but then they put Moon and Mars next to each other, and that's... They remo no, but they it. removed... So whoever did that PowerPoint didn't put the date, you know, they August the 27th, right. yeah. 2003. They just put August 27th, and also Every they missed year. that last line that says, in no, a telescope. No, no, no it's, it's, it's in there. there. It's in there. It is in yeah. there. In a mm. telescope is in there. Okay. So what people don't, people don't, um, what people don't re recall sometimes is that even the full moon in the sky is smaller than a dime held at arm's length. It's the size you of an aspirin. That. And you tell that to people, and they look at you like you're crazy. They say, no, of course it's not. It's much bigger than that. And you say, no, it True. isn't. Go try it. And, of course, they don't go try it. They don't go home and they got a dime and held his his arm's length. But if you do that, you will find that it's not so – so, yeah, I mean, it's, it's just – and that's how big it is in a telescope. Um, you do that in intro astronomy class, it blows their mind. Sure thing, you know? Yeah. They yeah, just it's like, it's don't the, realize um, Everyone tries – I mean, you don't need a dime. Hold your arm out, and it's the size of your, of your pinky 
fingernail. Yeah. So that's it. If you hold your, your <laughs> arm out, that's the size of the moon. And and it's great. Like hold it when it's down by the horizon and then hold it when it's way up high. You know how the moon looks so big on the horizon, but in fact it's the same size. Same thing. Yeah. Yeah. Blow blows their mind. So yeah, this won't it just won't die. So again, here we are. <laughs> Ten 10 years. 10 year anniversary. 10 year anniversary. We have been debunking this oh. every single year. The upside is that every year you've got the same post. You can just recycle it just recycle. on your web log. <laughs> no, Mars is still not as big They're as the moon. Still, uh, once again, not as big as the moon. Yeah. All right. Well, let's move on. Uh, so I want to talk about uh, something that actually happened, which was waving at Saturn. <laughs> Uh, so there's a great new picture of that uh, the Cassini folks put together. So uh, Jason, you, I think you sure covered this thing. a bit. Uh, uh, well, Alan, you did too. But the um, you know background story is back on July 19th. Uh, Cassini was taking some pictures of Saturn. It's taken a whole series of photos of Saturn, about 30 of them or so, and um, Saturn was between Cassini and the Sun. Um, so. It, you know, you end up with a really nice eclipse situation, and because the sun was blocked, Earth was uh, visible in the photos. Um, so some of these photos came out, and Earth is this little, you know, this little pale blue dot shining down and down underneath the rings. It's really beautiful, really awesome. And at the same time, um, there were a few uh, there were a few programs uh, set up that day by uh, NASA JPL and also by Carolyn Porco, um, the uh, uh, imaging director over at uh, Space Science Institute, um, of you know smiling at Saturn, wave at Saturn, um, you know, take take pictures of the event uh, because it really was the first time that people on Earth knew beforehand that they were going to have their photos, their group photo taken from 900 million miles away. So, uh, you know, it was, it was a really, really cool event. Well, what the people over at JPL have done is taken 1,400 of those photos that people took of their particular events from 40 countries around the world, assembled it into an image of the Earth, and shared it with the world. Um, I've got the uh, I've got the shot right here. I don't know how long it's going to take for it to uh, load up onto the screen here, but um, I'm in it. You know, I took a picture of uh, I took a picture of my cell phone of you know me waving out to where Saturn should be in the sky because of, it was still daytime here on the uh, on the U.S. East Coast, so you couldn't actually see Saturn. But you, uh, oh yeah, there you go. So that photo is made up of 1,400 different pictures from people all around the world waving towards Cassini. That's very cool. Very, very, very cool. Now, what we can expect to uh, come in over the next few weeks is a really, really beautiful image of Saturn with Earth visible in it from Cassini. Uh, the, uh, the folks over at Space Science Institute are still working hard on, on you know, this, this really beautiful hero image. Um, so we're looking forward to that. Right, and then there's also, uh, even though uh, this project with JPL is finished and they've got the mosaic there, there's another mosaic that the uh, group called Astronomers Without Borders mm -hmm. is going to be working on of Saturn that's made up in the same way, that they'll take, they'll take uh, hopefully hundreds or thousands of pictures that people have taken of themselves uh, that have a Saturn theme, maybe Saturn is in the background, maybe you've got a sign you're holding up saying, hello Saturn, and they'll put that into a mosaic that recreates the scene that Cassini saw from Saturn. And there are still a few days where you can submit your pictures if you go to Astronomers Without Borders and look for the Saturn Mosaic Project. You can still get in on, on one of these cool deals. Yeah, so they, they extended go. their deadline because um, yeah. you know they just wanted to get as many photos in as possible. So they, yeah, they extended it out a few weeks. Yep. News you can use. I mean, how awesome is that? You know, I mean, this is this is our picture from a million, mi a billion miles away. You know, very, very nearly a billion miles away, because because Cassini was actually you know a considerable distance past Saturn, and Saturn was about nine hundred million miles away. So you know, you add all that up. I mean, and that's still within our solar system, um, and our entire planet gets reduced down to basically a pixel. That's that's awesome. Yeah, yeah. You were saying like we're gonna have this stunning picture of Saturn as opposed to this stunning picture of Earth. We're gonna get a pixel. 
<laughs> yes. yes. The Earth yes. part is not going to go above pixel. I think somebody actually uh, did the math on, you know, the, the likelihood of a photon that's reflected off of you actually made its way into the image, and it's Don't tell me the incredibly odds. small. <laughs> you were telling me. We got it's some 100% downers. for you, Jason. <laughs> You're in the picture. You are the pixel. You are the pixel. The pixel that's... is you. No, uh, I mean, that picture that just came out of JPL, I, I did, you know, I looked through it. I, I'm in there, you know. I found mine. And, I, and if you sent a that. photo over, uh, if you sent a photo over to them, you can find yours as well. I think I'm about, uh, I'm a couple hundred miles south of the Galapagos and that. So they, <laughs> they definitely did not, uh, they definitely did not overlay the photos by, um, by uh, geographic locations. And they were looking for lots of blue, blue skies and lots of dark nighttime ones, I can see, because they had mm -hmm. all, the, all the space part, right? That's a, that's still that's really cool. Yeah. Um, okay, so solar flares uh, are they are they going to kill us or not, Brian? No. Okay. They're not going to kill us. Okay, that's <laughs> done. That's done. <laughs> Why do people think solar flares are going to kill us? Well, there was there was a rumor about uh, Edward Snowden apparently had released this information that the NSA had a prediction that in September this kill shot solar flare was going to hit the earth and millions of people would die of famine and this actually started on a parody site but then it was picked up and shared like mad so so this was at the beginning of August and then recently NASA put out a thing that a coronal mass ejection had occurred in the general direction of earth um, and that connected the two, which just confirmed that obviously, you know, in September we're doomed. Uh, and because it's, it takes a month for it to get here, you know. Apparently, uh, apparently so. Apparently yeah, so. And that particular <laughs> one was a was a slow moving a slow moving species of. I mean, I, where does this stuff come? How did I miss this? You know, I well, mean. It, <laughs> How did I miss this? I, maybe because I was moving and I entirely didn't see this bit of. Yeah, I missed this meme too. Well, no. I missed the meme about Snowden. That's a that's a twist. Yeah, that one a... that one came to me from a couple of followers on on Google Plus that asked me to write about this because they'd heard and they didn't know for sure. You know, how serious is this coronal mass ejection? So when I went back and did some background research, Snowden pops up in the NSA and and predictions of kill shots. <laughs> it just. It just goes down the rabbit hole very quickly. It's funny what people will will tack on to things to add a little bit of uh, veracity to 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 something, you know, um, yeah. like oh NSA. Well, that's 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 big in the news right now. We'll we'll put that in there, and you know Snowden. No, oh, that's that. You know his name's his name's still on the trending list on Twitter. So we'll put that on there too. You know, NSA is oh, one letter off from NASA. Right. Clearly, yeah. it's related. <laughs> when I when I when I well, see him on the list, I'm like NASA did what? Oh no, that's NSA. Ha have you <laughs> seen like have you done like any searching on YouTube for Comet Ison? Because it's just <laughs> madness. I, oh. It's yeah. it's just again it's a gong show of just pseudoscience and doomsday prophecy there. Oh yeah. Uh, it's amazing and people like and they use these. These nice animations from NASA and stuff, and they show how Ison's not going to get any closer than about five million kilometers, you know, really far from Earth. Or I don't know what the the closest approach is, but it's very far. And they're like, "See here, it's going to crash into us." But yeah, it's no, not. It that's the least of it. It's, then there's the ones where they where they show some uh, some poorly aligned. Uh, Hubble images and 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 claim that that's a you know rather than rather than NASA being transparent on their imaging process no this is actually showing the fact that it's a triple triple bladed UFO heading our way see look yeah. um, you know and and if you don't know what you're looking at you see well oh, I see three things so all right I guess so um, and you know. Then they had. Then they run around. You go, okay, I'd like it, and they send it off to their nieces and nephews, and that's how it ends up in my inbox on, or my uh, Facebook feed. This is some goofy stuff. So yeah. it's the same thing with the the planet. What is it? The planet that's heading towards oh, us. Oh, the Hebrew, the Hebrew planet X, yeah. all that yeah. stuff. Hebrew, yeah. and you know they'll take pictures with a lens flare, mm -hmm. and then point it out and say, oh, see, see that lens flare? That's yeah. where the planet is. There yeah. it is. Or Apparently you hold your camera up and you can see it, and you move it down and you can't. Yeah, or like a sun grazer comet in a Soho image or things yeah. like that. Yeah, it's ridiculous. Yeah. And, and it's, I, it's amazing how fast this spreads. 
And we, I mean, I don't know, if, we've been doing this for so many years now that this is just the background noise of what we have to deal with, whether it's... It's uh, perennial. And, and I'm sure Alan's been dealing with it longer than all of us. It is It is um, Bigfoot on Mars. It is the spiral in Norway. It is... Just all this stuff. What rabbits on Mars now in the in the imagery? There's worms on Mars. There's Nibru. There's wormwood. It just goes on and on and on, and we just have to keep debunking it and calmly saying no, it's not true. It's not going to happen. But if you're like not up for this work, I it think it never goes away. Yeah. It, it's just entertaining. It's the same. Uh, maybe there's one bureau that kind of pumps all this stuff out with the, you know, moon as big as uh, the Mars as big as the moon or or whatever. So yeah, well, yeah. interesting the sociology experiments you can do with this. I'm sure. Oh well, yeah. The 2012 <laughs> one was was a little troubling because all of the stuff that people said were, you know, 2012 was going to be the end of the world, and I got a lot of really bad, really scary emails from people mm -hmm. uh, worried about their future, like children. Teenagers. I, yep. I got an email from 11 year olds wondering well, if they were going to die this year and they were terrified about all the stuff that they were seeing and if once you enter this echo chamber you can just keep going down it just gets more and more reinforcing and I think a lot of those people are awful. And yeah. the people who've been who are who are doing this and they don't have their facts straight and they're just playing off each other for hits on YouTube, whatever, it's terrible and they should be really ashamed of themselves. Hopefully and for the, the flip side of all the, the people who were legitimately worried about 2012 in that way, the flip side of it is, look, nothing happens, they're going to be less likely to believe the next thing. And so because we've got these, these this media that is pervasive and everyone talking about it, that one was so big, maybe I keep hoping yeah. that maybe that... Yeah, people have selective that's memories, you know? That's the I mean, theory I've been running too, yeah, that, that 2012 was so big and so well popularized that that it was like a vaccination for nonsense that everybody That's took. Helping. Yeah. Yeah. Well, one of the challenges is misconceptions get reinforced when you try and debunk misconceptions. Yes. You this know, is so if, true. If you're Unless, an official yeah. site and you yeah. say this is not true. People hear it and then all of a sudden they think, well, I saw it on this official site. It must be true. They remember part of it. They remember the part of it that explains the thing you were debunking. They don't necessarily, yeah. unless you take that time to break down the, the misconception in your head and build up the new idea, which is something that you know teachers are trying to get their students to do in class, but it's harder to do in an informal medium. Unless you do that, yeah, the chances are the misconception is going to stay. Um, plus, if, plus like conspiracy theorists, if they really are true conspiracy theorists, they, as they say, they, conspir they, they enlarge their conspiracy to encompass you. As soon as, <laughs> yeah. as soon as you, as soon as you disagree with them, um, so now you're part of it. And anyone because I'm only that doing you, it for grant money. What's that? Oh, oh yeah, I'm, I'm doing, doing it for, it for my, money. I'm doing it for my check. I, I keep um, looking at my paycheck and wondering how this is a conspiracy. <laughs> <laughs> It's a rotten conspiracy. Yeah. Where's our checks from NASA? Yeah. Cheapest conspiracy ever. Um, okay, so uh, so one thing here, uh, Kate. Yes. Kate the Awesome Forty Two said hi everybody. Great to see this live. Hi Kate. Hi Kate. Hi, Kate. hi Kate. back. Um, She's asking but, about um, uh, uh, advice for new telescope. Yeah. So uh, a couple people have chimed in in the comments recommending the book Night Watch. I. Highly recommend that book. Uh, I've recommended binoculars, although Ciro rightly points out uh, the drawback is the stability of your arms with that, so you have to kind of lean against something or get a, a tripod. Um, and talk. To, if you can find an amateur astronomy group near you, totally go hang out with them, talk to them. They will show you the ins and outs of their telescopes, and that that is really helpful. Yeah, I mean, again, I wish David Dickinson hundred. was here. He's yeah. like a telescope master. Yeah, but we get this question every week on the Virtual Star Party. Yeah. So, so watch the Virtual Star Party. That's the other piece of advice. <laughs> yeah, exactly. But uh, you know, our recommendation is depending on how much you have to spend. If you've got a few hundred dollars to spend. I really like a, a nice, the modern go-to telescopes are pretty great for finding mm -hmm. the planets, finding the moon, finding some of the brighter deep sky objects and just being a reliable way to noodle around the night sky. That that I'll, There's a lot of purists that are just like, no, you've got to get a great big Dobsonian telescope and learn your constellations and that's great and you should, but it's really nice to just take a telescope, plunk it down, press a yeah. button and just start finding things yes. and, and I like those. And You can typically get like a six inch from, you know, from Celestron or Orion or one of those guys, 300 bucks or so and it's going to be a go-to telescope 
you know, on sale, and you're going to be really happy with that. You know, as, as long as you don't get one of those junk drugstore ones. Yeah, my go-to be, telescope just broke, problems. and it is very sad. And I do have a beautiful eight-inch Celestar, um, which does not have go-to, and I am learning my way around the sky all over again so I can do public night. But it's it's when you're there's a crowd there waiting for you. It's like extra no, anxious. No, no, just a little to the left. No, wait, right. Yeah. No, I missed it. Hold on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So yeah. There's a little bit of that. Third star passed. Yeah, Alderon. Uh, yeah. All right. Uh, so, also, can we bring up one more question by Rob Kroll? Sure. Um, he was asking about uh, the comet that was predicted to possibly hit Mars in 2014. Wondering if there's any new news about that. Uh, and I did a quick search and found a post from our good friend Phil Plate. Um, apparently, the the most recent um, observations show that the the chance of impact of this particular comet on Mars, uh, hitting Mars in 2014, is less than one in 100,000, and so the the risk the uh, the risk of impact has gone down. Yay for Mars, boo for us, because we really wanted to see something spectacular. So, uh, if you were wondering about that story from a few months ago, it's probably not going to happen. But it's going to. But there still may be some good observations from yes. from Mars because it will be close. Right. Sure. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so, and we do have some uh, spacecraft looking at that, and then uh, also speaking of Comet Ison, uh, the, they're planning to make some observations from Mars in October of Comet yes, Ison's flyby that's right. there. Curiosity is so. going to observe Ison. That's so cool. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's straight out of science fiction. I know. <laughs> Uh, okay, so the last thing, and I just wanted, we don't have a lot of time, so Alan, can you let people know about this exoplanet with a four-hour year? Oh, speaking of time, yeah. Uh, we, we've probably gone through a whole season on, uh, on something like Kepler-78b or KOI-1843.03. Those are the two planets that were talked about in some research from MIT uh, this week. Uh, one of them is, has a year of eight and a half days. That means it goes around its parent star in uh, eight and a half hours. Gosh, uh, eight and a half hours. And so there's another planet that just goes around in four and a quarter hours. And so <clears throat> they're whipping around so fast, they get so close, and it's so hot there that uh, the astronomers figure that these planets have to be made of mostly iron. Otherwise, it would just kind of melt uh, melt away. So either you've got molten lava on the surface or you've got red-hot iron. So uh, it may sound lovely to be able to, you know, go through a whole year and four hours and, and uh, maybe uh, take the rest of the time off, retire after, let's see, uh, how, how many how many days would that be? Uh, like you a could week or so, 65 yeah. years and you're done, but uh, you would be cooked. You'd be toast by that time. So there are pluses and minuses. You'd be burnt out. Yeah. Oh, burn out. oh yeah. I love it. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, why don't we wrap this up? So before we go, I want to give everyone a chance to let people know where they can find more. So where can we find more Alan Boyle? Uh, go to the easiest way is cosmiclog.com. That will take to take you to the NBC News uh, website and to the stuff that I do. Or you can watch Twitter at b zero y l e. Perfect. And Brian, you can find me on Google Plus. Um, that's why I post every day. I'm also on Twitter. Uh, I start teaching on Monday, so if any of my students are watching, get ready. <laughs> Bring the questions. Uh, Thad on the virtual star party. He he will uh, provide information, and then the uh, students ha are tested based on watching the virtual star party. So you know, you might if there you want if you want to throw some questions here, they they have to ask questions in the comments, and then we'll answer them. Then uh, you know they get extra credit. Uh, Jason Major, where do we find more? Uh, you can find me at uh, lightsinthedark.com. You can find me on Twitter over at, uh, at JP Major. Uh, I'm also writing at Universe Today and Discovery Space News. Nice. And Nicole. Dr. Hey. Nicole Gallucci. Uh, you can find me at noisyastronomer.com, and I work for CosmoQuest at CosmoQuest.org. So you can come do science with us. If you're going to be in Atlanta next weekend for uh, the for Dragon Con, come say hi. We've got a table at the Hilton. Uh, we'll be doing... Pal and I are doing a bunch of panels on the space and science and skeptic tracks. Uh, so please come say hello. I will not be joining you at Dragon Con this year. I know. I, I'm going to be at the... be rocking the con circuit elsewhere. Yeah, I'm going to be at the Penny Arcade Expo in Seattle. So video games. So you need to designate a... a Wait a minute. Alan, you live yeah, in... There you Seattle. go. Yeah. Uh -huh. Are so you coming to PAX? When is that? 
Never Next mind. <laughs> Never mind. <laughs> Labor Day. You, you need to you need to designate a second in command to take over the show. Oh yeah. Hmm. Hmm. Amy. We'll both be gone. Yeah, we will. All right, we'll figure it out. <laughs> okay. uh, so, and the next thing is going to be the virtual star party on Sunday night when it gets dark on the west coast. That's going to be nine o'clock, probably moving towards eight thirty. Actually, we're thinking we might mm -hmm. shift to eight thirty now to give the poor east coast Thank people a, a chance to watch before they go to sleep. So. Well, thanks everyone for watching. Remember, subscribe if you've gotten this far and you haven't subscribed. By all means, subscribe. Thanks to everybody who has uh, joined us. Thanks for everyone who is watching, and we will see you all next week. Bye.